Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. I am your bearded host, Jeff Black, joined by my always dapper co-host, Brandon DeCruz. Today it is episode 118, Losing Fat and Staying on Track While Traveling. Tips, tricks, strategies for keeping your fat loss progress going, even when you're on the road. Oh, this one's going to be good. At the very end, I might, Brandon, if you want to know how I travel, we can wait until the end because, you know, maybe chime in our own, but... Um, speaking of travel, before we kick this off, <laughs> um, how, how how screwed up was your week last week, dude? Yeah, man, I, I got to be honest with you. Um, I've traveled immensely, uh, especially when I had a corporate career. There was many years that I averaged between 65 to 75,000 miles on the road. And much of that was air travel. And I went out last week to visit Phoenix, Arizona. I wanted to uh, visit some friends. I'm also looking at different locations um, to potentially move to. And, and so I will be visiting you in the near future, my friend, and hopefully not having the same flight situation that I just had. But um, the trip was honestly, when I, I look at the trip in isolation, just the time that I spent in Arizona, it was incredible. The only thing was I did not pick the greatest time of year to go. So I initially, it was one of my long-term clients that I've had for more than two years. I said, listen, I don't want to get out there because he was moving from Scottsdale to Phoenix. And I said, I don't want to get out there in the dead of, of, of summer, essentially. I don't want full-blown summer because it's so hot out there. It's oppressively hot. So I said, listen, I don't want to go past like the end of June. So I went, you know, third week of June and I ended up going and I had looked it up in advance, but I booked this, this trip four months ago. And so obviously the projections for weather were a little bit different, but I ended up in a heat wave. So every day I was out there, it was over 110 degrees. And one of the days where we had more of like the outdoor activities, it ended up hitting a, a record for the month of June at 115 degrees. So to say it was hot was like, I'm burnt. Like you can see I'm red over here. But the trip in and of itself was great. I truly enjoyed my time training with them uh, and catching up with my friends out there. But honestly, the trip home was brutal. And this is something that I had told you. Um, honestly, for the first time in the two and a half years that you and I have been doing this show, I reached out to you Sunday night and I said, listen, there's no way I can record an episode this upcoming week. And, and luckily, I already had another episode recorded, which will go out the week prior to this one, which is with Dr. Scott. But um, I was supposed to get home Sunday afternoon. So everything was aligned for my next week in terms of, you know, Monday, I would be able to get right back into to the workflow and right back into my daily schedule. But um, first and foremost, there was a storm in Philly. So they delayed our flight. We just stayed on the on the airway, um, you know, for hours at a time. When we got back, they kept us on the tarmac for another three or four hours. So instead of getting home, say, at my projected time was about 6 p.m. on Sunday evening, um, I did not get off the flight till 2 a.m. And so then, you know, I'm waiting for my baggage. And there was a huge storm in Philadelphia. So they told us that it was going to be a delay in baggage, but it would be by the morning crew, essentially. So they would get it out to us. And I stayed there till 5 a.m. until they, they told my entire, this is my entire flight. This is not just myself. There's over 200 people that are waiting around this, this air baggage. And um, they told us that they were unable to get a staff to go out there due to the inclement weather, but that we would get our, our stuff sent to us um, by the next day. So I'm thinking, all right, well, now it's Monday morning. I got to go right back into work. So I got picked up, got an Uber. I went back. I literally got home, you know, because Philly's about two hours away from me. So I got home at like seven. I went right into check-in. So no sleep, no nothing. Um, so then later on in the evening, I reach out to the airline just to see like what is the confirm or what is the tracking on my my bag. I can't find anything online. And so the last week I've essentially sent spent trying to reach out and get information, but they literally have said that essentially like long story short is they lost our entire flight's baggage. So like every single person, over two hundred people, the the luggage that they had checked in from Phoenix to Philadelphia, they've told us it's still in Phoenix. It arrived in Philadelphia. They've told us all these different stories, but honestly, I've never, I've traveled so many times over the years, but I've literally never heard of an entire flight, their entire luggage going missing, not delayed. I mean, I'm over a week, ex you know, this, we got back, well, technically last Monday and it's Monday today when we're recording, but you know, our flight was intended to get back on Sunday night. So like this is eight days later and they have absolutely no, um, further information. Like here's your, your tracking or anything. So it just, it uh, kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And this is what I get for, for traveling out of the Northeast because, uh, you know, when I go to other areas and, and this is not for me hating on the Northeast because it's, it's built me essentially, but it is somewhere that I'm definitely going to be relocating elsewhere. But, um, it, it's just like how they communicate with people. It, they have like no, um, courtesy or like no cognizance. Like, dude, I lost two fully like stocked up checked bags. Like, you know, this minor compensation you want to give us to try to just like pacify us, but it doesn't really make up for the fact that I'm never going to get this stuff back and that you left me a week waiting. So it's, it's been a rough week, but I'm actually on another trip right now. So I, I flew out um, two days ago to come to Chicago. So I'm checking that out right now. 
And um, that flight was much better. So, you know, so far so good. And, and just hoping that my next flights, which my next flight technically will be to you, will be down to Nashville. And so I'm hoping that those go, those go well, because I will say, luckily with smaller airports, so like Nashville, when I fly into there, it, you, you, you've always been very gracious. You always pick me up. It's like super quick to get in and out. There's no long waits and stuff. When I go to an international airport like Philly, or especially Newark, it's like, I got to get there three or four hours in advance, which is fine, man. I, I'm very punctual with things, but it's just, it's such a like, um, it's such an elongated process, man. I, I'm looking forward to being in a place where I can get to and from an airport in you know, a reasonable amount of time. And then not also have to be there, you know, way early in advance, like my flight um, to get to Chicago, I had to get there at 5am because my flight was leaving a little after seven. So it's like, I have to be there way in advance. Um, so other than that, man, my week last week, a little bit rough this week going very well in Chicago, really liking the weather out here and, and the uh, time and, and energy that is really being allocated out here. So um, other than that, man, tell me about your week. I want to hear some positive vibes. Well, let's see. We got Joe Jeffrey's uh, seminar just launched. Six tickets already gone out of the possible 50 that were there. So that's cool. If you guys are looking to sign up, uh, the link is underneath my link tree on Instagram. Uh, you guys will be able to find it there. Joe and all of us are posting it. It's September 27th, 28th. The seminar will be off-site. My friend's party file restaurant, he has an upper floor. We're getting a whole room where we hold our chamber meeting. Um for the Donaldson Chamber of Commerce. So it's quaint. They'll be quiet. They'll be eight to four Friday, Saturday. And then Sunday will kick off at 12, be like a group workout where the physique collect will be just kind of doing stuff with everybody. Um, as always, the gym is free Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday while you're here. Um, but I'd love to make Joe Jeffries coming back to America for the first time in six years, a big event for him because he does put out a lot of knowledge that I see other coaches getting from him overseas and it's good to see where uh put the kind of the guy who's been bringing that to other coaches here so uh besides that man um last week we had to put our dog down uh, oh he had suffered a seizure uh he gets oh. he suffered a seizure before we came home like shaking he thought puppy dreams and then he went down and then um so it was kind of just really out of the blue especially after him and i had our ordeal but um you know so he, sorry to hear that. he was like nine years old for a pity. So, I mean, that's not bad about eight, nine. So, um, you know, other than that, things have been really, really quiet. I'm busy with work. I've got, I'm about to go to maybe a wait list just to kind of process something through, which I'd never have done. Um, I've just been other avenues of growth and uh, the results been paying off. So uh, all those, all those lunches, ladies and gentlemen, that I take with my friends that they don't charge me a fucking dollar for have paid off. I'm just letting you know, I'm just, Throwing that football down the field to those who might want to listen. But let's get into this topic, and I want to kind of get moving because I want Brandon to enjoy his time because he never fucking does anything but work. So I uh, love you, episode 118. So we're going to talk about losing fat and staying on track while traveling. So some tips, tricks, strategies for keeping your fat loss progress going even when you're on the road. Now, this is like the hardest thing for people to do. I swear to God, people overthink it. Uh, <laughs> and it paralyzes them. Um, and I want to run something by you, V, before we kick mm -hmm. this off. Okay, so I was talking to clients of mine. I, and she was a client. She's traveling. I said, well, just go to all new restaurants and just tell yourself it's never been this new restaurant before. When you travel, just eat the healthy option. She goes, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, often when you go out to eat, so for example, like if you go to like pizza and say Papa John's, right, you always associate yourself with that one food item you like, right? So then if you go to Outback and you get like the Aussie cheese fries, you probably won't go there and get the, the nice steak that they have that's healthy for you. You're probably going to go there. I said, when you pick new restaurants, you're predisposed, like you don't have any re predisposition. And I said, I know this is kind of true because if you hate a restaurant, you'll never go back. But if you love that one item, you'll always go back. So I said, when you travel, this is a great opportunity. Try new restaurants and tell yourself you're going to eat healthy things before you go. Um, so I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Do you think some that's a little psychological too when people travel? So I do think that there is a lot of food associations that we have. And even if you think about the context of uh, probably the best example would actually be in your grocery store. A lot of people, they have yeah. a preference towards a certain grocery store chain. So I'll tell you personally, I have a preference towards Costco. That's a place that I get bulk items and I know exactly what aisle it's going to be in. And even when I go to a different right down Costco, the street from me now, bro, they just oh, opened literally, literally half a mile down the road. Another reason for me to be in Nashville, my man. Just blew up here. 
I was like, yes. <laughs> Just another reason for me to relocate to Tennessee, my man. But um, exactly. so we all have an association with certain things, especially from a food um, perspective. So yes, when you're going to um, restaurants, especially that have a lot of hyper platable, energy dense, calorie packed and calorie laden foods. If you do have an association with that being something like a cheat meal or something like a meal that you look forward to in terms of like a cheesecake factory, you love to get one of their burgers and then, you know, a couple slices of cheesecake or a cheesecake platter. A lot of times when you're on the road, that might be a disadvantageous position to put yourself in, or we can really look at taking a different approach to how you order and really being able to optimize the options and the approach that you take to actually um, the meal construction so that you can make any restaurant that you go to. And I'm going to go, the last point on this uh, podcast will be me going over my intelligent ordering framework, with, which I've used with myself uh, since I first started traveling like well over 10 years ago uh, for work. And then also uh, I've used with many of clients. And I really want to make this, this podcast overall um, more in the context of those that have to travel for work, because when it comes to, you know, infrequent travel that you do with your family or you do with your friends or you do for a vacation or just a reset from life, I do think that there should be some dietary flexibility. And oftentimes I will build in something like a deficit deload, a diet break, or even just, you know, some um, non-tracking days within that, the context of that vacation. But there's a big difference between approaching a vacation that is once a year, twice a year, and then taking business and utilizing that same approach when you're traveling multiple times a month, that's really one of the biggest bottlenecks that I see. Okay, well, let's get into this. That's a good point. So topics for the week's show. So we're going to go over the introduction. So let's talk about traveling for work during a fat loss phase and then B, just go right on into the strategies, mm -hmm. releasing fat and staying on track when traveling. Now we'll pick up at strategy one together. Sounds good, my friend. So uh, on this week's episode, I wanted to cover a topic that is both timely for myself because I just returned from the trip and then I also am in a trip as we're currently sitting here. And it's also a topic that I go through with a lot of my long-term clients. And um, it's something that this is, can be a big bottleneck for many people. And I find that when I have this discussion with them and we really break down like more the logistics behind traveling and really being able to navigate the process, uh, it really is helpful for them. So I'll tell you personally, I work with a lot of high achievers, high performers, and busy work, working professionals, many of whom either have a demanding corporate career or who run their own businesses. And many of these clients are required to do some amount of work-related travel, and they need to go on at least a few business trips per year. I also work with some clients who are in a similar position and a similar career path to the one I was on before I went full-time with my coaching career. And so, you know, when I left that that entity, I stopped traveling as much. But when I was in my corporate career, which was in the sports nutrition industry, you know, I did something that many others do. So I did sales specifically. Uh, I also did research and development, but my sales career really brought me all around the country. So I have a lot of clients that work sales careers. They do consulting careers um, where they cover a specific region or entire country. So they're required to travel long distances, either by car or by plane nearly every week. And so frequent travel is something that can really put a wrench in a fat loss phase. As many do not go about these trips prepared and with a plan in place, which becomes a bottleneck in their ability to make consistent physique progress. And so I work with a lot of you know, individuals who do a ton of work, um, a ton of travel essentially for work and who have seen their physique progress derailed in the past due to the inconsistencies in their nutritional habits, their training um, frequency, as well as their activity levels when they're on the road and when they're traveling in comparison to when they're at home. And I myself spent you know, close to a decade in a career where I was a national sales director of a sports nutrition company. And there were several years where I averaged between 65 to 75,000 miles per year in travel. So believe me, if there's anyone that understands this, it's me. Because I, I do understand the trials, the tribulations, and the challenges of trying to pursue physique progress while also being required to travel for work. And this is why this podcast, I really want to differentiate between traveling that's required and then traveling that's for pleasure. Because if you guys are going out on a vacation once or twice per year, this isn't the podcast to really dial that in. You know, we've, we've covered like how to eat out at restaurants and things like that. That would be more of where we're incorporating more dietary flexibility. But I really want to cover what happens when you are someone that is in a, a, a career path, which is demanding and it's requiring you to travel so extensively. Are you going to let this derail the progress that you make? Are you always going to be taking one step forward to take two steps back? So for me, having a long history with having to travel for work while also balancing my attempts to make physique progress, it's made me a really proficient traveler. So for example, on this last trip <clears throat> that I just went on, I didn't miss a single meal. I didn't miss a beat. And I actually came back leaner. I'm in a fat loss phase currently, but I, I came back leaner than I left. 
And that's because I found strategies and workarounds over the years that work for staying on track and continuing to lose fat even when traveling. So it's important to realize that although traveling can make things a bit more challenging, there are some, like so many modern conveniences available to, to us and ways to maintain a lot of the positive habits needed to continue making physique progress, especially in the fat loss phase, that it's extremely possible to make the most out of these trips. So before I go into the strategies I'm going to lay out today, I wanna to make it clear that these are strategies I will use with clients that are frequently traveling and having to travel for work or who have very specific physique goals, like losing a significant amount of body fat, which would require them to continue dieting through the trip. So for instance, I have a, a client right now, her name's Nikki. She's a bunch of travel this summer. Uh, she's actually just went from Florida. She was over in the Keys and then she just flew into Boston this past weekend. Now she's in a fat loss phase, but it's for her wedding. We have a specific end date. So I'm having her diet through many of these, these occasions. And the reason for that is because we have a specific end date that we need to get her ready for. And this is a once for her, a once in a lifetime um, event being that it's her wedding. So this is very specific and, and context specific. But when I do have a client that's going on their once yearly vacation with their family, this isn't the approach I've had them take. This podcast is for all those out there, all the clients and all the people I know who travel a lot. And if they treated every business trip as a vacation, they would never accomplish their physique goals, their health goals, or their fitness goals. So I'm going to approach this topic purely through the context of how to lose fat and stay on track while traveling. So I'm going to cover, you know, four to, I'm actually going to cover five of the most helpful strategies I myself used during my last trip. And then also the strategies I've used with countless clients to help them continue losing fat and staying on track while traveling for work. So we're going to go through five broad-based strategies. The first is going to be make a plan and be prepared by preparing in advance. The second is going to be, be to bring portable foods and snacks that are easy to pack, travel with, and to hit your macros with. The third strategy is going to be to look for a spot to stay at that has everything you need. The fourth is going to be to hit a grocery store once you reach your target destination and stock up on everything you need so you have it at your disposal right at the start of the trip and you don't have to worry going forward. And then the fifth, I think is going to be the most helpful and applicable for many of you guys out there. And it's going to be the intelligent ordering framework that I use and I use with clients to how to like essentially order if you have to go out to eat while you're on one of these business trips. Because many of times I was put in a situation, I know many clients are as well, where it's a business dinner. It isn't like an option. It's like your boss is like, hey, five o'clock, you have to be at the steakhouse. There is no, hey, dude, I'm on a diet. It's like, all right, you know what? I will be there, but I'm going to make the most intelligent decisions to drive my goals forward. A hundred percent. So let's get into this. Strategy one, make a plan and be prepared by prepping in advance. Yes, sir. All right. So the most important strategy of them all is what you do even before you leave for your next trip and how you prepare for travel as this is what will either set you up for success or for failure when it comes to the goal of losing fat and staying on track while traveling. So by preparing or by failing to prepare, essentially, in advance, you are preparing to fail and are increasing your likelihood of falling off track, which is why having an intelligent plan in place is the first step to succeeding in the goal of continuing to drop body fat while traveling for work. And the first thing I do when I know I'll be traveling is to get my diet in place and to pre prepare my food in advance. So in the two to three days prior to leaving for travel, I'll always go grocery shopping when I'm still home. And why I do that is I want to have access to all my normal food sources that serve as the foundation to my fat loss diet. So I make sure to buy these in bulk for two reasons. So first, I want to prepare more than enough food for the duration of the trip that I'm going on. And so when it comes to business travel, that'll generally be between three and seven days. So I'm making sure I have more than, more than that quantity of food to supply me. And then second, I want to make sure that I don't come back to an empty fridge when I return home from that travel. As So essentially what I try to do is I try to aim to kill two birds with one stone by prepping enough food prior to leaving that it'll last my entire trip. And then I have a few days after, which is already stored in my refrigerator or in my freezer because traveling can be super unpredictable, just like the case was with me this past week. And it's stressful. So, you know, the smarter and safer approach is to prep your food both for your trip and then after so that when you're prepared for both travel and when you return home, especially if you're someone who has a stressful job where work-related stress really takes a toll on you, especially when you have to travel for it. And many of the trips I took during my corporate career were me flying across the country to do long presentations on the products of the brand that I sold, many of which I helped formulate. So these were not only physically demanding trips on my body because it was six or seven hour flights, you know, to and from the East to the West Coast, back to the East Coast, but also it was really mentally demanding. Um, I really had to get myself up for it and really be in a, a focus and cognitive state for it. So I used to return home drained from these, these um, trips, essentially, because I had to operate at such a high level. So the last thing I wanted to do when I returned home from a long trip and I was jet lagged was to start meal prepping, which mm -hmm. is why I did this in advance. 
And so after going grocery shopping, I start prepping my food in bulk. And so here's what I do personally and what I found to work for a lot of clients. So I'll go through some of like my own practical strategies, but I've also used these with many other people. So this is really something that where the rubber meets the road. Like I know that this works because I do it myself. And so my first priority is always prepping my lean protein sources first, as this is not only the most important macronutrient for body composition, for fat loss, and for managing satiety, but it's also the most uh, difficult to find lean sources of when you're on the road. And it's also the most expensive. So we're killing all these birds once some. And so I always cook and freeze my proteins in advance. And I'll usually stick to two sources of lean protein. So in this last trip, and even while I'm here in Chicago, I did grilled chicken uh, or chicken breast. And then I also did lean ground turkey, which makes it easy to prep, yet allows me to have two options to pick from. I then will also always take at least a two pound bag of whey of weight isolate, a uh, weight protein isolate, essentially. And I know that, you know, uh, what I pick is I pick something that I know that digests well. So in case um, I'll always bring, like in my specific case, I always bring a bag of weight plus from Legion athletics, because this is a brand that I know is high quality. It's a pure isolate. It sits well in my stomach. And because it's sold in bags, it takes up less room than like a, a big protein jug. I'll also pack other additives, protein additives, which are super convenient. So for instance, what I pack personally is I usually will pack some star kiss light tuna packets and I'll pack at least one built protein bar for each day that I'm going away. So when it comes to my protein intake, I'm completely covered for the trip, even prior to leaving. So this is already packed on my, my, um, my check-in bag, or even on my, the bag that I'm going to be carrying on. Next is carbs, which are far easier to prep. So the carbs I prep are going to be dependent on the phase that I'm in, as I vary my carb sources based on whether I'm in a dieting phase or I'm in a building phase. When I've traveled during building phases, I've usually cooked jasmine rice in advance and I've frozen it. But when I'm dieting, I'm usually going to bring more non-perishable carb sources like oatmeal. So I'll bring oatmeal packets, cream of rice, or pride foods, rice and grinds, which is very similar to cream of rice. It's just a, a rice product that conveniently comes in a bag. And then you can also pack items like low carb tortillas, rice cakes, low fat bread, bagels, and or like English muffins. And then for fat sources, I'd advise bringing like a bag of nuts, like that could be almonds or that could be cashews. And the last component that I pack are my supplements, because when it comes down to it, this is going to be the least uh, impactful or least important aspect. But I do think that this is still something that is advantageous to pack. If you're used to taking certain um, supplements or certain micronutrients, things like that, just continue with it. So what I'd recommend doing is putting your supplement pills and powders in plastic Ziploc bags and labeling them so you're not taking up excess space by bringing the full containers of those supplements. Plus, in most cases, you know exactly how many days you'll be away. So you don't need to take, say, 30 to 60 days of a multivitamin in this bottle when you're only traveling for three to six days. What I do personally is I always take two extra days worth of supplements because I've traveled enough to know that there's many trips that can often get extended, which was the case even just, just this past week in Arizona, where I got delayed because of a storm. So I had all my stuff for that next morning and I was able to take it, you know, uh, because it was actually on my, the bag that I carried onto the plane. So I got lucky that I had all my supplements, at least I didn't have any of my other stuff, but I had supplements to take. And so when it comes to supplements, the bare minimum I'd suggest bringing is something like a multivitamin, magnesium, maybe a fish oil, and then protein powder. And one last thing I'd suggest packing, especially if you don't want to overpay at say a convenience store or at the airport, especially is to pack healthy snacks like protein bars and beef jerkies. Um, so for me, my go-to protein bars to pack are built bars, which have the best protein to calorie ratio. But the other good options are say chocolate um, pure protein bars, which have 21 grams of protein and, and it's for 180 calories, or you can go with like the standard um, traditional, like go-to option, which is going to be a quest bar. Um, which literally can be found at every department store. Another good option is to pack low fat jerky, which is super convenient to just throw on your carry on. I mean, it's in a Ziploc bag, it's super um, portable, things of that sort. And so once I finish packing all the food, I'll freeze dry them and I'll either put them on my carry on or in one of my checked bags, which I'll do the morning of the flight to ensure they stay fresh. The reason why it's so important to have a plan in place and to prep in advance is because most people can't wing their nutrition and make progress even when they're at home. And they're in an environment where they're familiar with. So to be to expect that you could do so while traveling is super unrealistic. And really, when we think about it, especially in a fat loss phase, there's a lot less leeway and margin for error than there would be in a building phase when your calories are much higher. So if you plan on pursuing a better, fitter version of yourself long term and your career path requires travel, then you're going to have to learn to navigate these experiences with a food, you know, with first focusing on preparing for your trip, especially from a nutritional perspective as your diet and your total calorie intake are going to be the biggest drivers of your fat loss results. Okay. So 
strategy two: bring portable food snacks or easy tra pack travel and hit your macros with. And then the strategy three. So look for a spot to stay at that has what you need. So I'll let you kind of roll two and three together. Then you will clear up. So I know you gave a lot of just great information there about how you do travel. You know, if you have a job before you get into it. Strategy three, looking for a spot to stay at. Yeah, absolutely. So the second strategy, I'll, I'll start with the second strategy. Uh, and this is something I use for myself and I use with clients is we really want to set them up for success when traveling. And we want to be able to put us in the most advantageous position to stay on track as yeah, and continue to losing fat while being on the road. So what I do is I like to have myself and then also clients bring portable foods and snacks that are easy to pack, easy to travel with, and to hit your macros with. So there are a lot of easy to pack items that can make traveling and staying on part point far easier and more accessible. So some easy to pack protein options you can include, include like protein powders, protein bars, uh, tuna packets, beef jerky, some easy to pack carb options you can use include things like microwavable rice cups, cream of rice or cream of wheat, we got oatmeal packets and then rice cakes. And then some easy to pack fat options you can use include nuts, fish oil capsules. And then they even have like the individual natural nut butter packets. I know Justin's has them and there's multiple brands that have them. And it makes it so you don't have to, you technically can't bring a full jar of peanut butter. If you ever try that, like to bring it on your carry on, um, you will get that taken away from you because it's not a solid food. So this is where you can just bring those little um, individual serving packets. And you should be sure to pack some meals or food items in your carry-on to tie you over for the flight. And I always recommend packing an extra meal or snack or two in case you hit a delay. As some, you know, having something that fits your nutrition plan is always better than nothing. And having to resort to whatever hyperplatable food items or the airport is selling at a crazy markup or is being served on the plane is, is generally like the um, inferior option, essentially. Then when it comes to strategy three that you alluded to was to look for a spot to stay at that has everything you need or essentially has at least the basics of what you need. And this is something that I found to be extremely beneficial to help clients stay on point because it just puts them in a better position to be able to access things that they need. And then also it helps them get back into a normal, more of a normalized routine despite being away from home. So when I first started traveling for work, there was no such thing as Airbnb and it wasn't prominent or widely used as it is you know, today. And honestly, Airbnb wasn't that prominent until a few years ago and into, you know, well into my traveling career. So for the first two, few years that I was on the road, I stayed at a hotel for nearly every single trip that I did. So if you are someone that's in the situation where you don't use an Airbnb or your, your company books you at a hotel and you need to stay at a hotel, what I would recommend doing is checking out the amenities on their website or calling the exact hotel location you're staying at and making sure they have at least the bare necessities, which would be a refrigerator, even if it's a mini fridge, um, a microwave. And I'd also look into a fitness center to see if it's an, a viable option to train at, or if not, at least a place where you can conveniently get your morning cardio done at. Now, when I would stay at hotels that only, you know, the only amenities I would personally pack, or when they only had those amenities, I would personally pack other things to really be able to supplement the things that I needed in that hotel room. So Back in the day, I used to travel with a hot plate that I would cook, you know, simple items like egg whites or chicken, um, omelets in. I'd often bring a mini George Foreman grill, which is something you could still purchase. It's about 20 bucks. It's, it's super uh, inexpensive and really convenient to pack. You could throw that right on your check-in bag. Um, and they, they're sold at pretty much any department store or even on Amazon. And you can cook chicken breasts in them. You could cook your proteins in them. You can even do potatoes in them. Uh, and then I'd also go to the store and I would buy one of those disposable um, and reusable styrofoam coolers, or those are things that are like five bucks, but I'd be able to store any food that I couldn't fit in the mini fridge. So I would cook it and then I would just freeze it on ice, which ice is going to be available at every single hotel you go to. Another option that I opted for during those years that I didn't have access to an Airbnb. And I, even I still do this on occasion when I'm traveling is I would stay at a Homewood Suites as these can be found all across the United States. And they have a full kitchen or a kitchenette. They have a microwave, they have a stovetop, and they have a dishwasher. Nowadays, though, when I travel, I, I like to stay at Airbnbs and I always select a spot that has a full kitchen and is near a gym and a grocery store. So now I'm more selective with how I go about traveling. And it's honestly made it far more um, easy for me and convenient. And it really helps me stay on point without having to stress as much. So, for example, this past week when I was in Airbnb in Phoenix, I had a full kitchen at a microwave, at a refrigerator and a freezer. I had a fitness center to do cardio at. I had an all these grocery store within five minutes walking distance. And then I also had a 24 hour plan of fitness within 10 minutes driving distance. And this was no coincidence. This is not, not like I just, it was happenstance. I specifically looked for a spot to stay at that had all these amenities as this made my stay much more suitable 
when I looked at what do I have to do to stay in alignment with my goals? So what I would recommend doing the next time you travel is to look for an Airbnb that's in a condo or an apartment complex, and it has a kitchen, a fridge, a microwave, and then also a complex fitness center with at least treadmill and cardio equipment. I would also recommend checking out the gyms near the area you're staying at so that you know if you're going to be able to train or not. One of my you know, non-negotiables when traveling is that I will have a 24-hour gym within 10 to 15 minutes driving distance of where I'm staying as I work out super early. Jeff knows this. Um, and when I travel, such as this past week, when I was visiting a client, I still have a full work day to get done. So if I was to wait for a gym to open at, say, 6 or 7 a.m., where I usually go to the gym far earlier than that, it would throw off my workflow, which I won't compromise. It's, I'm not going on these vacations. Like This is not the, the impetus of this trip that I'm on right now in Chicago or in Phoenix. Like this was, I was checking out properties, but I was also doing work related stuff. And I was also making sure that I was getting back to every single client. Most of my clients didn't even know I was away. And that's a big priority to me. So I make sure that I need a gym that's going to be open when I'm ready and able to train and it's not going to throw off my day. So for many of you out there, you're most likely not training as early as I do. So you probably train later in the morning or in the afternoon. So this is not going to be an issue for you, but if your fitness goals are really important to you, don't just assume that there'll be, there will be a gym near where you're at. So I made this mistake personally. I'll tell you, I made a horrendous mistake one year that I went out to, um, it was back in 2016. I went to the Arnold classic and it was myself and a buddy of mine who at that time he was an IFB, he's still an IFBB pro, but he was an active IFBB pro on the circuit. And he was two weeks out from his next show. And we rented a spot outside of Columbus thinking we'd be able to find a gym because we thought, Oh, Columbus, Ohio, you know, it's known for the Arnold. There's gotta be gyms, but we were in East Bumble. And so the nearest gym to us, um, that opened early was more than 30 minutes away. And at that time, it was 2016. We didn't have a, uh, a rental, unfortunately. We did everything by, by taxi. So every day we paid for a taxi to take us more than 30 minutes to a gym so that we could train as he was so close to a show. And I, at that time, was four weeks out myself. So there was no missed cardio sessions there. you know. And also, uh, for any of you guys have been to the Arnold Classic, it's often during like the end of winter. So it was snowing out there. So like it was not a great situation to say the least. And so it was a massive waste of time and money. But the upside of that was the gym that I ended up finding us. Uh, I needed to find a 24-hour gym, essentially, or one that opened up really early. And the one that we found and was actually owned by a guy named Corey Gregory, who was the guy that started and created a supplement company, Muscle Farm, if many of you guys are familiar with that. And he used to own this gym called Old School uh, Gym, which would open at 4 a.m. <clears throat> for something that he would refer to as the 4 a.m. club. So seeing as we get there super early, we were able to work out with him, which was a huge plus. And it was... Really cool because at that time, Corey was a big name in the fitness industry. And, and even at the, like specifically at that time, he had just signed Arnold Schwarzenegger as his brand partner. So Arnold had a brand under Muscle Farm. So the environment that he was at, like the environment his gym was in and, and the aura of it was, it was honestly incredible. And it was extremely motivating to be around, especially as I was dragging my ass by that point in the prep. But what I will say nowadays, I make sure that there's a gym that's in, in very close um, proximity to me that is going to be suitable for my training, for my needs. And this doesn't mean that every single person has to go out of their way to get like a crazy fitness center. Like when I was in Phoenix, we went to um, Fit Lab AZ, which was actually a really well suited. It was a 24 hour facility. Right now I'm going to Lifetime in Chicago, uh, which is a hot, literally, I mean like a 30 second walk from uh, where I'm staying right now. So it's, it's super convenient, but this is a priority to me. But even if you guys aren't as dialed in on your, your uh, training or on your physique goals, still make it a priority to get in there. Don't put yourself in a disadvantageous position. I can't tell you how many times over the years clients have told me, Hey, I, I you know, I'm going to be training on this vacation. It's like, all right, well, let's just aim. You usually train four times a week. Let's at least aim for two to three sessions. And it's like, then they realize that they're in a location where the next gym is 45 minutes away. And it's like, it's all for nothing. And they feel like uh, they failed the process. If they had just looked in advance, like seen that, or if they had looked in advance and realized, hey, the nearest gym's 45 minutes, I would have just, you know, essentially put them in a modified deload. So we would have had a plan in place in advance. Whereas when you don't prepare and you go into a situation, then you set yourself up for failure. Okay. So with that being said, let's get into strategy four. Hit the yes, grocery sir. store. Once you reach your destination, stock up on everything you need. Yeah. So this is actually why I like to stay at an Airbnb or a rental that has a kitchen as anything I haven't cooked and or packed in advance. I'll go right to the grocery store and grab once I land. And I always cook my protein sources in advance. So I'll have my grilled chicken and my ground turkey prepared and ready with me for when I land. So the main two items that I need to grab when I go to the store in my target destination are carbs and produce. And these are things that it's just super easy to not only prepare once you're at your target des destination, but in the case of produce, this is fresh items that you don't want to pack and, and bring on luggage. However, if I ever do run out of protein or when I haven't been able to cook enough protein 
for a day or two when traveling. So say I'm going away for seven days. I was only able to prepare five days for some reason. Um, what I'll end up doing is I will grab protein shakes. I'll grab protein RTDs at the store, which they can honestly be found nearly at any store these days. I'll get low fat deli turkey or I'll get non-fat Greek yogurt. Now for carbs, uh, the carb I usually buy during fat loss phases are potatoes due to the fact that they're the high satiety starchy carbohydrate. So I'll either grab whole sweet potatoes or white potatoes, which I can bake in the microwave or oven. And I'll even grab bags of pre-cut sweet potatoes, which I can cook in the microwave. I'll usually check if there's a rice cooker in the rental. And if so, I'll buy like a small bag of, of uh, jasmine rice. But if not, what I do is, is I'll just grab organic rice cups. And I make sure that these aren't the ones that are filled with added and refined oils as I'm not looking to have like a high fat rice. Like I, I just want the rice itself. So I, I, I'm very specific with this. I look at the label uh, and I look at the ingredient list as well. And then also I'll pick up easy to access carbs um, or carbs that are easy to make, such as in the microwave. So that'll be things like your cream of rice, your oatmeal and your cream of wheat. For produce, what I really like want to do is to ensure I'm getting multiple servings of both veggies and fruits per day. So what I will do is I'll grab a few bags of frozen vegetables, which I can easily make in the microwave. And when it comes down to it, like depending on the vegetable, it's generally going to take between five and seven minutes to cook like a massive bag that's going to have multiple servings of vegetables. So that's super convenient. And then also I'll grab bags of salad so that I can make what I refer to as my sweet mustard salad, which I make by combining, you know, garden salad, whether that be you know, garden um, variety that could be classic iceberg lettuce or it could be Italian salad. And then I'll add yellow mustard and I'll add liquid Splenda together, which makes for a very low uh, calorie sweet uh, honey mustard dressing, which allows me to save hundreds of calories as I'm replacing my dressing with a healthy low calorie alternative. Then when it comes to fruit, I always make sure to get frozen fruit when I'm traveling so that I can not only purchase it in bulk because they come in these huge bags, but I also, that also makes sure that it doesn't go bad during my stay as I want to be able to grab everything in one trip. That's why when I get to my target destination, I go right to the grocery store. I grab everything I need for that week. I have a list on me um, when I do this. And then I make sure that I'm not spending extra time having to run to the grocery store here and there um, throughout the course of my trip. And I'll also usually go with either frozen strawberries. It's usually a mix. So I'll usually go with a bag of frozen strawberries and a bag of blueberries when traveling as these are both low calorie density foods. Uh, or fruits that have a ton of food volume and are highly satiating. They're nutrient rich in terms of their vitamin, their mineral, and their polyphenol and antioxidant content. And they also provide a dose of fiber, which helps to keep me satiated and also helps to keep my digestion on point, which is another thing that I find that a lot of people, they veer off so much in terms of their food source selection, their food quality when they're traveling that they come back and their digestion direct. And that honestly, for me, that's just not worth it to essentially go on a trip, try to enjoy myself. And then the next week I'm, I'm essentially paying for it. So I'm very cognizant of that myself. Okay, so then let's get in this last one. The intelligent framework you might need if you want to eat out when traveling, and you want to talk about using yours. So mm -hmm. using your intelligent ordering uh, framework, you need to eat out when traveling. Absolutely. So the fifth and final strategy that I'm going to cover on today's podcast is my intelligent ordering framework, which I suggest you use if you need to eat out on the road during a dining phase. So this ordering framework has went through many iterations over the years, but it's something I initially started working on when I first started tra uh, traveling for work over a decade ago. And over the past 10 years that I've been coaching, I've updated it, I've improved it, and then I've expanded upon it. So the goal of this ordering framework is to put you in the best position to su uh, succeed when you have to eat out for a work meeting, for a business dinner, or a work event on the road, and you're unable to bring your own food. So that's a big, um, I guess, caveat to this. So the first thing is to do a liquid preload prior to the meal even starting. So when you get to the restaurant and you order drinks, they come around, that's the first thing that they're gonna ask you for. Uh, what drink would you like? I recommend getting two zero or low calorie drinks to be able to preload the meals with fluids, which will help to increase your satiety and decrease your appetite. I do this myself by using the two cup rule where I'll ask for a cup of water with lemon. And then I'll also get a diet soda of some sort. So that could be Diet Coke, um, Diet Pepsi, Pepsi Max, uh, Coke Zero, any of those varieties, uh, Sprite Zero, whatever it may be. And so I'm getting two large cups and I make sure that I finish them prior to my actual meal being brought out. And using this two cup rule will help to improve your hydration, which can often take a hit when you're traveling. And this is important because thirst and a lack of hydration can often be mistaken for hunger. And then also using a liquid preload prior to your meal can also help to manage hunger, um, appetite, and it can also decrease total calorie intake at that meal and can allow you to sustain a deficit in an easier manner, which is really what we're trying to leverage. We're trying to make this as easy and as attainable of a, a situation as possible, especially when you're on the road and there's a lot of temptation coming your way. If you're super hungry and you haven't managed your appetite, it's going to make it so much harder to turn down these hyperplatable energy dense foods. 
And really the reason that I use this liquid preload strategy is because it's gonna increase feelings of fullness and better manage appetite. And when we actually look into literature on this, many of the liquid preload studies look at the effect of drinking at least two cups or 16 ounces of water 30 minutes prior to a meal and finds that individuals report higher levels of fullness and lower levels of hunger when compared to not having that liquid preload prior to that meal. Research also finds that the liquid preload usually leads people to consuming about 10% less calories at that meal. And this increase in fullness and decrease in energy intake also seems to compound over time. And in the trials where water preloads have been used uh, prior to each, like, so if someone's in a dieting phase and we use them every day prior to that person's main meals, they've seen better weight loss outcomes. So it's a super easy way to feel fuller within a meal and also to help moderate your calorie intake when eating out at a restaurant. Now, step two of my intelligent ordering framework is to order a simple yet satiating meal that consists of mainly single ingredient whole foods. So what I need, you know, when I need to eat out on the road, what I like to do is I like to look for meals that have simple whole food components, which are going to be far more satiating and easier to track than if I got a mixed dish, like a pasta dish, which is filled with all these ingredients, these sauces, flavors, and additives. So I'll usually look for a lean protein source, like a grilled chicken breast or a lean meat, like sirloin steak or filet as these are high protein foods that will help me hit my protein target, keep me satiated, but they're also lower fat alternatives to other protein sources can, or other protein containing items on the menu, such as, you know, chicken thighs, chicken fingers, chicken wings, uh, burgers, or these fatty cuts of like New York, you know, steak, essentially. Now, step three of my intelligent ordering framework is to fill up on low calorie density veggies. So for the veggie portion of my meal, I'll usually go with a plain salad, a side salad or a garden salad. And I do that because salads are a high volume, low calorie source of veggies, which are going to be one of the few vegetable options at a restaurant where we can get a lot of bang for our buck in terms of the amount that we get and the low calories that are contained in it. And it's also one of the few veggie sources that you can guarantee will come out without oil, without butter and without sauces or, or um, essentially dressings added to it if you ask for that. And, and really when it comes down to it, almost every single, I mean, pretty much every single restaurant is going to have you know, fresh pre and lettuce. So you're going to be able to get that regardless of where you go. Um, step four, my intelligent ordering framework is to remove the empty calories from the meal that are coming from liquid calorie sources. So this is multifactorial. I'm really going to focus on the meal itself, but that also includes like your beverages. Instead of getting juice, you know, or, or getting a full sugar soda or sugar sweetened beverage, go with a diet alternative or just water. And when I'm ordering a meal, I'll always ask the server what the meal I've ordered is cooked in, which generally happens to be butter or some type of oil at most restaurants. So what I do is I ask them to simply not cook my meal in any butter or oil. And I just tell them that I have an allergy to the additives, which in my case isn't a farce. Like I actually don't digest um, refined oils well. So it's not going to go my way if I do have them. And also I'm saving a ton of calories in that case. And I do this. So I'm not taking in a bunch of empty calories that aren't going to add to my satiety at all. And also, so it's easier for me to track my macros and calories for that meal as it's hard to estimate how much added fats were used when, it, when a food was cooked in it. It's, it's so hard to be able to estimate or guesstimate that. Also, if a meal that I ordered has any sauces that go with it, I'll ask that they put them on the side and so that they're not actually already included on the entree themselves. I'll also generally will, will ask for certain condiments that I know um, are low calorie. So for instance, I'll always ask for hot sauce for my protein as that's going to be the lowest calorie condiment available. And then for my salad, I will ask for yellow mustard on the side, which has a very low amount of calories in it. And then I'll lick, I'll, I'll mix liquid Splenda in it, which I always have with me. So I always have like a little squirt bottle essentially. Uh, and I do that when I'm traveling because this makes for this sweet mustard uh, sauce essentially, which many of my clients are familiar with. And it's, it makes so that you're able to enjoy a salad that isn't dry, but you're saving hundreds of calories. And the reason, you know, you can, if, if you can't, you know, if you don't remember to bring liquid Splenda, you can ask for packets of, of Splenda itself or another non nutritive sweetener, uh, whether that be aspartame or equal or one of those. But I do want you to keep in mind that these, when you get the actual packets, they're cut with sweeteners like dextrose, which is a pure carb source. So for every packet you use, it has about one gram of carbohydrates. And I say this because I've met individuals who usually that literally use 30 plus packets per day. And this does add up. So keep that in mind. Like these aren't, you know, yes, the actual artificial sweetener basically has no calories, but the binding agent that they put with it um, is, is calorie containing essentially. Then step five of my intelligent ordering framework is to order a satiating carb source if you have enough carbs left for the day to do so. So many times when I'm dieting, I'll just stick with a lean protein source and a salad. But if I do have a large amount of carbs left, I'll go with something like a plain baked potato or a sweet potato. As these are both carb sources, you can order plain almost anywhere you go and there won't be anything added to it. So it's super easy to track. And potatoes are also one of the highest satiety foods. 
So it'll provide you with a ton of fullness, which can really help with hunger management on a diet. Now, if potatoes aren't an option at a restaurant that you go to, what I do personally, and what I would advise you guys do is to go with a piece of fruit. So that could be a fruit salad. Uh, that could be a piece of fruit, like an apple or a banana or whatever it may be. And these are going to be both fairly filling and then also fairly easy to track. So when it comes to advice, I found most helpful for both myself and my clients when incorporating meals out during a diet, it all starts with, you know, um, really having an intelligent ordering framework that you're able to go out to a restaurant and order a meal that fits within, you know, you choose an option that fits within your goals and your calorie budget, and you don't overdo it. Because a lot of times what ends up happening is people just order things because they, they don't want to bother anyone, or essentially they don't want to ask for additives or alternatives or adjustments. Keep in mind, you're paying for this meal. And a lot of times when we go out to restaurants these days, it's not cheap. So if you can do it very curiously, Jeff has been with me many a times in restaurants where I've been very polite in, in terms of how I, I guess I express the fact that I, I need some adjustments made to my meal. But at the same time, you know, a lot of times they're very accommodating. You can say you have an allergy or that you can even be honest and say, Hey, listen, I'm on a diet. I'm, I'm really just trying to stay on point with things. And a lot of times people are, are um, empathetic to that. And they're also understanding. So it's not like people are out to get you, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. And, and if you don't ask, you don't go out of your way. They're going to put exact, they're going to prepare the meal exactly like it, it's supposed to be. And it's supposed to be hyper playable and energy dense. And it's not about improving your fitness, but if you are someone with very physique oriented and physique focused goals, you need to be cognizant of this. Um, so this is essentially like a built out guide to how to travel and stay on point with your diet when you're doing so for work. And so this is, you know, just suggestions and insights and strategies and tips and tricks that I've learned myself and then also utilize with clients. But Jeff, I would also love to hear some of your approaches and what you find to be useful. I was just thinking like, so for me, I very rarely travel. I'm different than you in that regard, you know. Um, so when I travel, when I go off the grid, I am notorious for doing coffee from about 3 a.m. all the way to 11, which I eat my first time. <laughs> well, I like to go to different coffee shops when I, I do too. travel. And so I'm like, I'll have a few. I walk around. It gets me my steps and stuff like that. And, you know, I do better. It's nice to kind the point of me going on vacation is to sh shut off the shit that I normally do day to day over and over and over and over and over. I've been doing 30 years. So I was 15 in high school, like eight and a half if you count. I mean, so I ain't half the physical therapy. So for me, I will do coffee all the way to 11. I'll eat what I want for lunch and I do whatever I want for dinner around five and I get a dessert somewhere and that's it. And it's just because I, I wouldn't do that, recommend that to all my clients. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're kind of, you have this buckled down, when you travel, it has to be what you're comfortable with. And for me, that's the perfect time for me to actually throw a switch and be someone else other than the entrepreneur, bodybuilder, whatever title I have to give myself tag in my own head. And I get to be just relaxed. And I enjoy it, dude. I see so much more. It's way more, it's way less stressful. You've seen that with me. You see how I am. Yeah. It's I think we also, I think we also have to take into consideration and also put out the context that you generally don't eat two meals per day. So what you're doing is you're saving up calories early in the day yep. so that you have a, a larger budget. So it is, it, you're still considering accommodating your goals or, or essentially your calorie and energy targets, which are higher than most people. Cause you have a fucking ton of tissue, dude. Um, so we always have to yep. take that in consideration. We can't have, you know, a woman that only eats two meals a day and then she exactly. goes oh, I'm wild two meals. And expect her to stay on track. That wouldn't be the oh. case, but I do, I have seen that with you and I do understand where you're coming from for sure. Yeah. And I think for, and then it goes to me with clients. I'm like, Hey, what are you trying to do? Like if you're going to France and Spain, you know, you're going to be walking around a lot and the food's smaller over there. I've everyone I've talked to. That. Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't know, man. I, I think, when, I think if travel's your every week gig, then yes, you got to learn how to play with it. But if you're going like away once or twice a year and you've been doing good, I uh, have a little like you can like brandon said take all his advice and then you can still do what i do and maybe have one meal off that's a day and that way you're you know doing stuff so um i the one thing i do tell clients and myself i don't track i don't tell anybody to track when they're on vacation i'm like just enjoy it man so i think you, that was a great episode um very applicable is there anything you want to round off with before we round up today no, uh, just, uh, I will wrap it up and just leave the audience with um, maybe just a little insight. Like for instance, I've literally traveled hundreds of thousands of miles and many years I've had to prep for a show or a photo shoot and while being on the road. So 
the strategies that I shared today were as a result of being really having to be really proficient at adhering to a diet and finding workarounds and strategies to continue making progress while traveling for work. Because if I were to do what most people do, which is to say F it and just wing it every time that I, I traveled, I would never mm-hmm. have been as successful with the fat loss fees as I had. But like Jeff said, and I said this in the beginning of the podcast, listen, if they, you're a once or twice a year vacationer, this isn't the podcast for you. But I do work. Yeah. And I do know a lot of people that they just very much struggle with their physicals. And it's because they're traveling for work. And this is a requirement. And that is their priority. They aren't physique athletes. They aren't fitness professionals like you and I. However, um, this is something that's impairing their health. A lot of times I work with a lot of um, high level executives, CEOs, uh, VPs of companies, and they've sacrificed you know, their 20s, 30s, and 40s and their health within those years because they were going on the road so much and they fell into bad habits. So this is really a podcast for all of you guys out there for that. But uh, other than that, man, I- I'm-, I'm good on-, on my end. I will tell the rest of the audience, man, uh, that's a wrap for another episode of the Chasing Clarity Podcast. If you need anything from me, such as one-on-one coaching, feel free to reach out to me uh, through my email, which is Fitness at gmail.com, or you can find me on Instagram. Jeff, where can they find you, my man? Yeah, if you guys are looking to find me, I am on YouTube under Hard Conversations with Jeff Robo Scooby, Jeff Unbreakable Black on Instagram, and uh, I'm Jeff Unbreakable Black on TikTok, which I do love TikTok the most. Dear Lord. <laughs> Dude, I love it. The content on there is so much better. It's way less, I don't know, the algorithm is just more fire. Um, but guys, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys are really looking to help us out, share, like the show and all that. Tell Brandon he's wise to move to Nashville so we can do this in person and try to, you know, make it worth something. But, you know, hey, whatever, B, what can I say? <laughs> hey, you know that you're one of the options, my friend. And I'm not I saying know. that it's like a, you're a side piece. Um, you are one of my top options. I better not be a fucking piece. side piece. I'd be pissed. But you know, like I, we did, we had discussions off here. I do want to check out some other locations, and and this is a big move because I will be relocating myself and then also my family. So, um, this is something that I take uh, not with a grain of salt. I'm taking this seriously, and I'm really looking at places and trying to find the ne- where I'm going to start the next chapter of my life. So, you know, as always, my man, it's always a pleasure to be with you. I wish the rest of the audience a great week, and uh, let's get out of here. All right, bro. Well, you have yourself a beautiful day. Peace. You too. Peace.